We are all familiar with the mad woman in the attic of 19th century literature. The deranged lunatic who raves in the shuttered tower of a gothic mansion. Or paces the corridors of darkened houses bemoaning the loss of a lover or desertion by a husband. Catherine Earnshaw in Wuthering Heights becomes delirious and exhibits symptoms of what we would call anorexia because of the strain of her stormy relationship with Heathcliff. Miss Havisham, in Great Expectations, suffers a complete mental collapse after she is jilted at the altar and tries to stop time itself whilst plotting to wreak revenge on all the male sex. Bertha Mason, the first Mrs. Rochester in Jane Eyre, whose ghostly apparition is accompanied by strange laughs, screams and incomprehensible babbling, in true Gothic novel style, is the original Mad Woman in the Attic. There are many other examples, but we must ask the question, why are women particularly prone to lunacy in 19th century literature? Prior to the 18th century, madness was most definitely seen as a male malady, at least in medical texts. But over the course of the 18th century, the idea that women were biologically more liable to go mad began to emerge. Not only were menstruation, childbearing and menopause regarded as causes of possible mental derangement, but women were regarded as more exposed to the disappointments of life and having fewer resources with which to cope with life's setbacks. Even tea drinking and novel reading, according to Dr Thomas Trotter, could be, in his words, fatal to the female mind. But what was the reality of women's mental health at the turn of the 19th century? Who were the women confined in Bethlehem Royal Hospital, or Bedlam as it's better known, and why were they there? Let us then consider some of the authentic cases and hear something of the real voices of these unfortunates. Anne Mould, born 1734, imagines she has committed murder on her unborn child and wants to be hung. This is due to her taking of poison in order to abort the pregnancy. I have committed murder and deserve to be hanged. Let me go at once to Newgate. Keeping me here is only tormenting me worse. I know I must be hanged and why not let me suffer at once? Anna Pryor, born 1753. When the nurse is absent, she repairs to the window and raves, rants, screams, flings about her arms and attracts a crowd about the building. God Almighty comes and runs things into the guts of poor Hannah Pryor. Mary Banks, born in 1776. It would require no extraordinary effort of credulity to believe her possessed of an evil spirit, or that most furious of furies was her familiar. There is nothing in Billingsgate, St Giles, or any other school of ferocious rage, malice or eloquence that can afford a slight specimen of her preeminence in these points. When excited to gross indecency of her language, the scurrilous volubility of her tongue cannot be described. Especially the physicians are the objects of her talents, and her talons, if it were not for the keepers. And Mumford destroyed her child by severing its head from its body. She believes the devil directed her to do it. She is violent and considered dangerous to herself and others. Mary Austin, in a fit of insanity, cut out the tongues of her two children to prevent them telling lies. She believes all mothers should do the same to save much tale-telling, idle talk and mischief. She is very much deranged, but chiefly melancholy and desponding. So we learn through these few harrowing accounts that reality can be far more chilling and dramatic than fiction. In 1823, amongst the patients in Bethlehem were Jane Long, who believes she is Queen Caroline, as does Charlotte Harding. 
Mary Smart believes she is Queen Mary, consort of George IV, and Anne Gibbons believes herself to be a royal princess. As well as these, others claim to be dispossessed heiresses. I wonder if any of them were telling the truth. 